how we can ask our questions in an organized manner. Today's topic will be know your myeloma immunotherapy antibody drug conjugates. During the, the as a part of this immunotherapy treatment chapter, one of my goals is to really dive deep into the immunotherapies that are out there and better understand them because these are things that are either entering your body, your loved one's body, affecting your life with their side effect profile, et cetera. Um, I, I hopefully increasing the quality of your life as well as the longevity of your life. And so today we're gathered to learn about antibody drug conjugates that can help fight myeloma. And we're hearing from the expertise of Dr. Jesus Bredeca, who I'll introduce formally in just a moment. We're going to be talking about what's the mechanism of action, what types of antibody drug conjugates are FDA approved, and are there any on the horizon, and what is the future of ADCs in, the, in, in myeloma, and what might their side effect profile be as well. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Bredeja to you. He received his undergraduate degree from Stanford University and medical degree from Harvard University, so he's very intelligent, <laughs> completed, completed his internship and residency in the Department of Internal Medicine at the University of California in San Francisco, and fellowships in medical oncology and hematology at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine in Baltimore. Prior to joining the staff at the Sarah Cannon Research Institute in Tennessee Oncology, Dr. Berdeja held appointments in the stem cell and bone marrow transplant program and in the Division of Hematology and Oncology at Loma Linda University in Loma Linda, California. Dr. Berdeja has been certified a diplomat in internal medicine, medical oncology, and hematology by the Board of Internal Medicine. Additionally, he is an active member of several professional organizations, including the International Myeloma Society, American Society of Clinical Oncology, the American Society of Hematology, International Myeloma Working Group, Clinical Trials Myeloma Intergroup Committee, and the Center for International Blood and Marrow Transplant Research Plasma Cell Working Group. An active researcher, Dr. Berdeja has been the principal investigator on a number of funded clinical trials in the field of multiple myeloma, and he has published extensively in peer-reviewed literature and is a frequent invited lecturer. We are extremely grateful and privileged to have Dr. Berdeja with us today to talk about antibody drug conjugates, better understand the role that this immunotherapy can play in myeloma treatment. With that being said, I'll turn the time over to you, Dr. Berdeja, and thank you for being here today. My pleasure, as always, and thank you for showing that picture. You remind me what it used to look like. Um, <laughs> but let me share my screen here. All right, but, but thank you again for inviting me. I always enjoy these uh, talks, and I hope that uh, you get as much of it uh, as I do from them. I'm sorry that I can't see you all out there, but I know that some of you are watching me. So, so thank you for attending. So um, I'll, I'll get right into it. So today we're gonna to talk about the antibody drug conjugates. So let's start with a little bit sort of an introduction. Um, so when you talk about immunotherapy, uh, we're looking at uh, several uh, things. So one are the monoclonal antibodies and these you know very well, they're things like Darflex um, and uh, uh, Lisa and uh, for example, and these directly target the myeloma uh, cells. Um, you also have uh, ways to overcome immune suppression, and that includes the imids and the checkpoint inhibitors. You can also boost uh, certain cells in your body to help fight myeloma, and that, an example of that is the CAR T cells. And of course, you can also activate uh, your immune system to try and fight myeloma, which is sort of the idea behind vaccines, not too dissimilar from how vaccines work in the infectious disease world. So today we're going to talk about antibodies, and there's three particular types of antibodies. So the first type is what we call antibody. This is just an antibody that is uh, has nothing else attached to it. Uh, it binds to a cell of, uh, for example, myeloma cell, and then it waits for the immune system to come and recognize that bound antibody and kill the myeloma cells. Drug, antibody drug conjugates, we'll talk about a lot more. And then you can also, we now also have bispecific antibodies. And the idea here, as you can see in the cartoon there, is that you have two full antibodies and you can have two full antibodies together or just pieces of those antibodies um, and that recognize two different sites. And one site is the myeloma cell and the other site is CD3 on a T cell, for example. And so these redirect the T cells to kill the myeloma cells and they're called uh, bispecific antibodies, uh, which, I'm sure somebody will be talking about it at some point in the future. Today we're going to actually concentrate on antibody drug conjugates. 
So what this means is you take an antibody and this antibody is now bound to a payload. And it's usually, this is usually a drug uh, or it could also be radiation, for example. Uh, so the idea here is that the target, uh, the antibody binds to the target and then it is internalized and it kills the myeloma cells by delivering this. The target that you all probably know very well at this point is BCMA. And so BCMA now, there's a lot of immunotherapies developed against BCMA. And so why is BCMA such a great target? So you can see here, um, we have sort of the, uh, the natural sort of progression of uh, how a plasma cell the plasma cell from the lymphocyte and it eventually comes malignant into myeloma. And BCMA is expressed uh, as the cell sort of kind of matures and its expression actually increases uh, in the plasma cells and it actually increases further as the cell becomes malignant and it's expressed much more avidly in myeloma cells. And so that makes it an excellent target for myeloma cells. The other thing is that it has really no expression in other normal tissues. So uh, technically, if you can sort of kill the cells that have BCMA expressed, you won't affect any other cells in the, in the body, and that will help with the side effect profiles. BCMA actually is a very important uh, molecule for the plasma cell, um, and so because of that, it has a key role in B-cell maturation and differentiation and allows the cells to survive, and so because of that, the cells uh, will express it, and so it should be incredibly rare that a cell would not express BCMA. So we'll start with um, the most sort of dominant in this class, uh, the first uh, antibody drug conjugate, uh, that's elantinum macrophilum. And so here in this cartoon, you see on the left, and I don't know if you will see my arrow or not, but I'm using it just in case. Um, and you see here on the left, you have the, the actual conjugate, and that's the in gray is the antibody, and then those little uh, sort of orange uh, circles around the antibody are, is, is the toxin, the chemotherapy. And so if you go to the middle picture, you see uh, the green is the myeloma cell. Um, and then you have in purple here, the BCMA protein sitting on top of the cell. And so now you have your antibody drug conjugate that can bind the cell. And so its main mechanism of action is to then, uh, this whole uh, complex is internalized into the cell uh, and so once it's internalized, it gets cleaved and the chemotherapy gets released and it kills the myeloma cell from within. Another uh, uh, mechanism of action for this is that this antibody actually still functions as an antibody. So if you go to the right here, you see that the antibody is bound to BCMA and it still has this FC receptor. And the FC receptor is what allows your own immune system, so cells like your T cells, to recognize the bound antibody and to kill the myeloma cell uh, via that process that we call ADCC, very similar to uh, how DAR selects and implicitly would work. So, belantamide mafodotin was first studied in the DREAM1 study, uh, and that was the phase one study that established that uh, LMAF was safe and effective. And the dose uh, that was determined there was 3.4 milligrams intravenously every three weeks. The DREAM2 study then was the pivotal study that kind of looked at that dose, but also tested a different dose of two milligrams every three weeks. The reason uh, that was done is because as we started to see more patients on the treatment, started seeing that there were some particular toxicities we would talk about that they hoped would, they would be able to sort of mitigate uh, by looking at a lower dose and seeing how efficacious it was. Here I have just a summary uh, of the DREAM1 and DREAM2 study. So the DREAM1 study is in the first row, and uh, that myeloma after they've had a proteasome inhibitor uh, and an IMID uh, and transplant, but did not require C38 uh, therapy. And so 35 patients and uh, the response rate was 60% with the median progression-free survival. So that was the original studies and that amazing. So when we looked further into that study, however, this study was accrued mostly in Canada uh, and in Canada at the time, um, daratumumab or, or no anti-CD38 antibody was uh, approved uh, for use. And so a lot of these patients actually were naive to anti-CD38. So in the DREAM2 study, which is the second row, you see that the patients now were required to have re relapse refractory myeloma after an IMID, after a PI, 
and also an anti-CD38 antibody. And so when you look at that, the overall response rates are, are lower and more of what sort of kind of we expect with sort of the single agents uh, in these late line of therapies in the much heavily treated population with overall response rates of about 31 to 34%. And you can see that it was very similar for both the 2.5 milligram per kilogram and the 3.4 milligram per kilogram dose. Uh, the median PFS uh, was short, uh, three to four to five months, which we see in this uh, sort of kind of late, uh, heavily treated population. But there was an update of the DREAM2 study um, presented at ASCO in 2020 that looked just specifically at the 2.5 milligram per kilogram dose. And what we saw that is in those patients that did have a response, the response was actually quite durable and lasted for 11 months uh, with the median overall survival of 13.7 months. So quite impressive uh, in terms of sort of how long lasting these responses can be. What about the side effects? So if we look at the side effect profile, big orange box, you see that, that this is a profile for just a kilogram per kilogram dose. Uh, so if you look at that, uh, you see at the top that the main toxicity that uh, was seen was this thing called keratoxin, which was toxicity to the corneum. And that was seen in most of the patients or it's in most patients. And this was- Rudeka, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, yes. Something's strange with your audio that it's going in and out. I'm not really sure. What's happening? Do you have a microphone or? I do. Can, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. It would just go like in and out and in and out. So I wanted to. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get the microphone much closer to me. Is that better? Uh-huh, I think so, yeah. I'll let you know if it happens again, but I, I think okay. we're good now. Thank you. Sorry, I apologize to everybody, but um, so we'll try and continue and, uh, um, and hopefully my audio is better. So just to backtrack a little bit, so here we're seeing the side effect profile of uh, belantum and mafodotin at the 2.5 milligram per kilogram dose. Um, and so the main toxicity that uh, we see with this that's different from pretty much every other drug in myeloma is this thing called keratopathy, which is toxicity to the cornea. And that was seen in 72% of the patients. And this often was picked up by an eye exam by an ophthalmologist um, with the a patient potentially being completely asymptomatic. But if people were going to have symptoms, it was usually uh, blurred vision seen in 22%, uh, dry eyes in 14%. And there were some patients that uh, uh, reported decreased vision. Um, I'm sorry for the typos there, but those, that's basically what that says. Um, there were also infusion reactions, which were pretty mild, only in 20% of patients, so much less than the monoclonal antibodies. Uh, and then other toxicities included low platelets in about 35% of patients, but these were pretty transient and usually with the first, second cycles of therapy. Uh, and otherwise, there were minim minimal other uh, side effects. So when we look at the actual toxicities to the eye, um, it is very important that patients who receive this drug have a uh, an exam by an ophthalmologist or optometrist uh, to sort of have a baseline uh, exam. Uh, the symptoms uh, once you're on treatment can include dry eyes, blurred vision, changes in vision, uh, and or you may have no symptoms at all. And so it is important sort of that people kind of get eye exams and the FDA actually mandates eye exams before each dose of therapy to try and catch this before it becomes a problem. So as noted before, 72% of patients did have keratopathy on examination and about 50% of patients on sort of clinical trials sort of uh, not just DREAM2, but other trials, have reported significant worsening in their vision. Uh, so it is an important side effect. The good news, it is generally reversible. So in terms of management, um, it is important to, to identify it. Uh, and as soon as it gets to a grade of concern or symptoms of concern, uh, then the drug is usually held, held or stopped or dose reduced. Uh, and with that, usually the symptoms resolve. Um, so because of that, it is very important that an ophthalmologist or an optometrist uh, follows along with your oncologist and the FDA mandates an exam before each dose is given. Uh, most patients <clears throat> who do develop eye toxicity are able to continue on the treatment, uh, which is the good news. Uh, and then in terms of sort of kind of treatment for this, there's really not much other than just supportive care. Uh, lubricating eye drops are important. Uh, they help with the symptoms. Uh, steroid drops don't usually help. So based on this data, uh, belantum and mefidotin became Blenrep, and it was FDA approved in August of 2020. 
Uh, the dose is 2.5 milligrams per kilograms intravenously every three weeks. Uh, it is approved for adults with previously treated multiple myeloma, and, and patients must have had at least four prior lines of therapy that include an IMID, which, for example, Revlimid or Pomalist, a Perizome inhibitor, either Velcate, Carprolis, or Minaro, and an anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody, uh, Sardarsalex or Sarcasa. So in terms of sort of where we're going with this drug, um, <clears throat> there are combination studies that are being looked at in the relapse refractory patients. And these are combinations with standard of care um, uh, drugs. So for example, DREAM6 and DREAM7 are combinations with uh, bortezomib or Relcade or with lenalidomide, otherwise known as Revlimid. Uh, and there's early data with that combination showing the excellent activity. Uh, the DREAM8 study is a combination with pomalidomide and dexamethasone. And that was actually recently presented presented by Dr. Trudell, ASH 2020 meeting, and that shows with very promising uh, results uh, with excellent toxicity. And I'll talk a little bit more about that setting in a second. And then other combinations are ongoing as well that haven't reported clinical data yet. There is also a potential, I told you that this is not just an antibody drug conjugate uh, that delivers chemotherapy, but also can mediate sort of antibody type responses. And so the question becomes, can you uh, use this in combination with other immunotherapies trying to boost the immune system's response to this treatment. And that's what the DREAM5 study is trying to do. Uh, and there was uh, uh, early data in combination with this uh, agent called ICOS, which is an agonist uh, basically stimulating uh, your, an immune response uh, to the myeloma, uh, against myeloma. And that was presented uh, this year at ASH uh, in December. Uh, there are also combination studies being looked at in the newly diagnosed patient. And so DREAM9 was presented as well, and that's uh, uh, Bellamap. Uh, with uh, bortezomib, lundamide, dexamethasone, or VRD, which is a very common uh, combination. And this is in transplant eligible, newly diagnosed uh, patients. And uh, basically, the early results show that this is feasible uh, and that it's uh, tolerable. So, more to come with these combinations, but that's sort of where this development is, is heading for galantamide mapidotin. In terms of the dosing, the truth is we actually don't know the optimal dosing schedule, and that's still being investigated. Um, and so the goal here is to improve or maintain the efficacy. So what we're seeing is that, uh, and while reducing the toxicity, and what we're seeing is that patients who do get some of that eye toxicity have to be held. And usually during the whole, patients do well. Um, and then you often either resume the dose or continue at a lower dose and, and the response continues. And so because of that, it, uh, it appears that maybe we don't have to be as aggressive with the dosing and with the frequency. And so actually doses as low as 1.9 milligram per kilogram are being investigated. And the schedule that is currently every three weeks uh, uh, in terms of dosing has been, uh, has been investigated every four weeks, even up to eight weeks uh, instead of every three weeks. Uh, there is also arms looking at whether the dose needs to be split given over two days instead of one day. And so a lot of these schedules are being investigated uh, in all these different combination trials uh, that I discussed a little bit earlier. But again, I think the important uh, thing to note here is that if you do have toxicity on the current schedule, um, uh, most patients are able to maintain their response during a treatment hold and can continue to respond even with dose reductions or less frequent dosing. So it's important that if you are experiencing some of this, that you talk to your uh, doctor about uh, uh, dose uh, changes and even schedule uh, changes. So I'm briefly gonna talk about MEDI2228, uh, which is another antibody drug conjugate. Um, and, and, and this illustrates a couple of points. So this is, a, a, the antibody goes against BCMA, just like uh, Blenrep. But in this case, instead of MMAF, um, the actual chemotherapy is this really huge picture here. Uh, is called PBD, um, and PBD has very different side effect profiles, uh, as you will note. Uh, but basically, the idea here is that the antibody drug conjugate get, binds to BCMA, it gets internalized, and it releases the chemotherapy, just like with Blenrep. It's just a different type of chemotherapy. But interestingly, with this antibody, they actually remove the FC portion, which is what usually allows it to be a monoclonal antibody as well. Uh, and so this does not have uh, the monoclonal antibody effects like Blenrep. So data was presented at ASH 2020 by Dr. Kumar um, and the dose escalated. And so here in blue, you see what was considered sort of the, 
the optimal dose that they were going to uh, carry further at 0.14 milligrams per kilogram. And so 41 patients, they saw an overall response of 65%, which is quite impressive, and even including DGPRs and CRs. When they looked at the toxicity, um, the toxicity profile is very different from what we saw with GlenRep. And so here you still get some eye issues, but this is photophobia. And so this is very different from corneal toxicity, which was not seen with this drug. Here, uh, patients basically um, uh, had pain uh, when exposed to light, similar to when some people get migraines and you kind of get that photophobia. And that was very common. It was seen in 58% of patients. Uh, and that was the most common uh, cause for dose emissions or discontinuation. A rash was also seen uh, in 32% of patients. Uh, and then when you look in the other column here, you see low platelets in about 30% of patients. But you also see pleural effusions, which means there's fluid around the covering of the lung. And that was seen in 24% of patients. And there are other ADC conjugates and other diseases that use the same chemotherapy. Uh, and photophobia, rash, and pleural effusions are not uncommon with those ADCs. So we know that these toxicities are coming from the actual chemotherapy that is bound to the antibody. Uh, and so that's important as you kind of uh, see the different ADCs. Uh, it's not just about uh, what they're binding, but also what, um, what their payload or toxin uh, of choice is that will, that will potentially result uh, in the toxicity profile. Unfortunately, uh, despite uh, this looking promising, um, it is unclear if Medi-228 will be developed further. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, that part of that is, has to do with just how crowded the anti-BCMA space is. Uh, perhaps the toxicity they felt would not be something uh, that they wanted to continue to develop. But, um, you know, it, it, it's possible that someone might pick it up and, 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 this, uh, and perhaps try different schedules, just like we're doing with GlenRep, to try and mitigate some of those toxicities. But uh, it's a good proof of concept uh, with ABCs. Um, so stay tuned uh, from that standpoint. But as it stands right now, GlenRep or Valentima methadone is still the only FDA-approved ABC against myeloma. And so we have some unanswered questions uh, for ABCs. Uh, and then after this, I'll stop and then discuss uh, sort of uh, uh, more of this in your questions. But uh, so the antibody drug conjugates. Um, so how do they compare to the naked antibodies uh, such as Darcelex? Um, you know, I, with BlendRep, it was difficult to know whether it was the actual chemotherapy delivery that was uh, leading to the responses or was it the actual antibody? Uh, I think Medi 2228 showed us that uh, even if you don't have the antibody, that the, the delivery of the toxin can be effective. Um, and so now you have, you know, the uh, it's a so now you have two different mechanisms of action, which may make it preferable to a monoclonal antibody. Um, and so you can deliver both the toxin and function like an antibody. And so that's potentially a plus uh, from a standpoint of uh, uh, of activity. And just like we saw with Darcelex. The initial responses are similar, and as you move it in combination, uh, it becomes much, much more active, which is what we're hoping to see with the ADC. The problem, of course, is when you do add the toxin to this, is you may increase the activity, but then you also will increase the toxicity. Um, and so, as we've seen, the toxicity is very particular to the payload that is being used uh, with BlendRep, and specifically the MMAF. Uh, we know uh, and seen with other uh, ADCs and other diseases that use MMAF that this corneal toxicity is being driven likely by the toxin, although it's not 100% clear. Um, and the question is whether uh, this toxicity will limit its uh, combination potential, because if it does, then that could become a problem, because uh, then you will have to use it just as a single agent as it is approved uh, now. Um, the other thing is, you know, in myeloma, uh, even though most of us don't like it, as I'm sure you don't like it, is uh, the treatments are given long-term, right? So the patients usually stay on treatment, especially in the relapse refractory setting, until uh, intolerance uh, or progression. And so uh, with these types of toxicities, is this a type of drug that could can be given long-term? And the answer is we don't know. We still don't know the optimal dose or schedule to minimize the toxicity, so that uh, st stay tuned. Um, unfortunately, in myeloma, we do have several uh, similar examples. Uh, recall uh, kyprolis or carfizumib, where the dose that was originally FDA approved was very different from the doses that we're using now, and that includes the schedule. 
Uh, and so it's not unusual for us to have to do this sort of later on after the FDA approval. Um, the other drug that comes to mind uh, is Selenexor. So Selenexor also was approved at a certain dose and schedule. And then as the uh, drug started to be combined, it was seen uh, that you couldn't use that same dose and schedule and to mitigate uh, 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 toxicities, uh, the doses have been changed as is the schedule. Uh, so the same thing is happening with uh, uh, blend reps. So kind of stay tuned as to what will up become the optimal dose and schedule. And it may actually be patient specific. So um, how do the ADCs compare to other BCMA-directed therapies? So obviously, uh, as you all know, or will hear or have heard, there are these things called bispecifics. There are CAR T cells uh, that uh, go against BCMA. Uh, and so these are looking very powerful, very effective. Um, the truth is we actually don't know exactly if someone's had a BCMA-directed therapy, uh, whether they will respond to another BCMA therapy. Most of the early studies of CAR-Ts and bispecifics and even uh, belantamab excluded patients who had prior BCMA therapies. The good news is um, as we learn more about why people uh, may stop uh, responding to these treatments, uh, it does not look like people are, or people's myeloma cells are losing the BCMA. Um, and so it is very possible that the mechanisms of resistance are very different for the different drugs. Uh, and now there's emerging data uh, that having had one prior BCMA therapy doesn't necessarily affect um, the ability for another one to work. Um, there actually are some studies ongoing with some of the CAR T's and bispecifics looking specifically at patients who have had prior BCMA therapies, which will help us answer that question as to whether we can kind of give these uh, one after the other. Um, and so, uh, you know, for, uh, for now, we sort of are left with, this is, this is where we are, um, I, and, but uh, can they be uh, sequenced? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, is that optimal? We don't know. Uh, and so actually with that, I will stop and I will happy to answer questions and have a discussion. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Rodeja. I really appreciate your preparation for this. And I'm excited to get into the questions and answers as well after an awesome presentation. Um, I guess one of my first questions would be, who is your ideal candidate for ADCs in myeloma? Who do you recommend out of your patient population um, for ADCs? Yeah, I think, you know, when we look at sort of the BCMA directed therapies, and again, like I said, there's no good data to know how to best sort of sequence or whether we can sequence these, meaning we can give one after the other. So if I have a patient in front of me and I have um, a CAR, right now the only FDA approved BCMA therapies are, are blend rep, which is an ADC, or you have two CAR T cells, right? You have idocell and silk to cell. Um, and so the, 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 the two different, the therapies are very different. So the, the CAR-Ts are much more likely to give a response uh, and to maybe give a deeper response and potentially last longer uh, than the ADC. The problem with the CAR-Ts is that you have to wait for it. So the patient that is best for a CAR-T, for example, is someone that um, is able to collect, you have to collect your cells and then your disease has to sort of be controlled to be able to deliver the CAR T. There are some patients that unfortunately can't wait that long and may need something right away. And so that's a patient that I may kind of go with the off the shelf treatment like blend rep. On the, on the sort of the opposite side of that is also you know, the CAR T's do have some toxicities that can make it difficult for more frail patients. Uh, and so oftentimes a frail patient may be a better candidate for something like uh, blend rep, where really the main toxicity uh, is the sort of protein uh, deposited in the cornea, which oftentimes is asymptomatic and is reversible. Uh, and so uh, it is, in my, in my uh, experience, uh, it is otherwise very well tolerated. And so, and so oftentimes that's the patient that I may choose the ABC versus the CAR-T. Excellent. Thank you. Let's talk a little bit more about that eye toxicity, the keratopathy. How do you say it? Car keratopathy. Yeah. That. <laughs> After how many treatments do eye issues tend to appear? Um, it can actually be just after one. Um, and so it's, that's why the, the, the current FDA REMS program mandates that um, if you're going to start a blend rep, that you get an ophthalmologic exam, and it can be an optometrist, not be an ophthalmologist, 
um, as a baseline. And then before each subsequent treatment, uh, that exam has to be reviewed by your oncologist to make sure that you can proceed with the next dose or if it has to be held or if it has to be adjusted. Uh, and so then usually what happens, let's say after two doses, you develop grade three keratopathy, which usually mandates that you hold um, until it reduces to a grade one or better, meaning that much lower level of, uh, or even completely resolves, uh, then usually the drug is held until that happens. And then you start uh, again, depending on the grade on the same dose, and oftentimes you don't get the same problem, or the mandate is to reduce the dose. And so there are very specific guidelines uh, set uh, that your oncologist will follow uh, based on the results of the exam. But yeah, it can be as early as after the first dose. Interesting. And you said some patients are asymptomatic. Would you say more than not, or would you say most of the patients experience significant current? I would problems? say about uh, half the patients are asymptomatic. Okay. So, uh, and again, part of that is because I think most will become symptomatic if you just let it go. Um, but that's because uh, we're looking very closely and you're, it's more about what you're seeing on the eye exam that mandates what you do than more about the patient's uh, symptoms. Now, actually, there is a, a way to sort of, there is a test uh, looking at sort of symptoms, uh, being really, really, really good about sort of kind of assessing symptoms uh, from the patient standpoint that may predict who's going to develop uh, keratopathy and so forth without the uh, waiting for the exam. But uh, at least at this point, um, you know, the symptoms can be so subtle that people just don't, don't report them. Right. Yeah. So it's important to, to, to report any symptom very quickly, but at the same time to also realize that it is important to get that test. I know it's an inconvenience to have to go to different doctor appointments, uh, but it is a very important part of making this a safe therapy. Awesome. Thank you. Joseph's wondering if, um, oh, that's, that's my next question before we ask that. Is Blenrap known to cause any problems with tasting? Uh, it, it is not, actually. Um, uh, there's definitely other drugs uh, that can't, but uh, this at least has not been reported in many okay. cases. Just realize that some, in, in when you look at studies, uh, as some patients may be getting blood rapid combination with other drugs. And so then the symptom side effect profile may be very different once you start combining. But with the single agent, that's, that hasn't been reported. Interesting. Okay. Uh, lots of great questions about BCMA coming up. So Joseph's wondering, can a myeloma cell survive without BCMA? Uh, unfortunately, it can. Um, so, you know, BCMA is very important in, in the normal uh, development of plasma cells. But as we know, once these plasma cells become malignant and become myeloma cells, sometimes they do take sort of uh, superpowers, I guess, uh, in that uh, they can uh, they they develop other ways of surviving. Uh, and so, unfortunately, the answer is yes. Uh, and and we know that because there are patients uh, uh, that have had a CAR T, for example, uh, that have lost um, sort of the gene that actually makes BCMA. Uh, and so their cells do not uh, produce BCMA any further, uh, but they're still alive. So, so yes, unfortunately, they can develop other ways to survive. Interesting and unfortunate how smart these myeloma cells are. Um, so is BCMA expressed then on other non-cancer normal cells? Um, the short answer is no. Um, and that's what makes this a great target. Um, uh, Obviously, you, uh, there's a lot of other uh, drugs, and as, as you know, there, uh, there is a CAR-T. Uh, well, actually, there's two CAR-Ts that are FDA approved against BCMA, uh, and in one in particular, we're starting to see this sort of late neurotoxicity, um, in which we can't really explain, uh, but then uh, there was a report uh, that was done in one of the patients that developed this uh, and unfortunately did not uh, uh, eventually ended up dying uh, from myeloma and, or the toxicity. Uh, and so at autopsy, this person was found to have uh, a loss of the uh, basal ganglia uh, cells that sort of kind of were shown to express BCMA. And so it's possible that there is a cell in the nervous system that can express it. Um, but again, that is a very unusual toxicity. We haven't seen it with any of the other BCMA uh, uh, drugs. And it's possible that it's just like the super, super like um, sensitive uh, drugs that may uh, sort of be able to detect that little tiny detection that's outside of the plasma cells, but 
but that's really it. Whereas with other drugs, usually you see, or with other targets, you usually expression in other cell lines and other uh, you know, skin cells and uh, or BCMA, it's really just the plasma cells or the late B cells. Yeah, that's fascinating. Where are the side effects coming from then? You know, as you were just mentioning, sometimes certain drugs attack other cells because they're similar to the genetic makeup of myeloma cells. So where are the side effects coming from in BCMA targeted therapies? Just in general, BCMA targeted therapies. So I think the the big, uh, <laughs> I know it's a big question. <laughs> we've left one room. Um, so I think the toxicities are specific to the mechanisms of action. So the good news is at least the actual target itself is probably again the the is expressed the most um, um, direct on the on the on the plasma cells with very little. Um, other expression. And so that's why you've seen a lot of drugs against PCMA. But it often is not from the, uh, the cell that is targeted, but often by the mechanisms of action. So with Blender, for example, we talked about sort of the mechanism being the actual payload. Uh, and so the keratopathy is actually the, the drug, right? The NMAF, just like with Medi-2228, the different uh, toxin led to different toxicities. With the bispecifics and with the CAR-Ts, uh, most of the toxicity is coming from actually the, uh, the incredible uh, stimulation of the immune system that is actually leading to the toxicities. And so usually you think of cytokine release syndrome and neurotoxicity, and those are things that are being created by the activation of your T cells uh, and the release of all these cytokines. Uh, and so it's actually, um, it's, it has nothing to do with BCMA at all. Um, it has to do more with sort of kind of what your drug is doing. And so here with Blenrep, we are not, this is not considered a T-cell redirecting therapy, so we don't see cytokine release or neurotoxicity uh, as you would with the bispecifics or CAR-T. And that's an excellent answer to the question. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Um, how long does the toxin stay in the body? So the toxin yeah, so enters, enters the body. How long does it stay? It, it actually um, it actually gets excreted pretty quickly, um, and there's very little toxin that is actually uh, dissociated from uh, the antibody. So it really should only be going directly into the myeloma cell, uh, and very little circulating toxin. And that's why you can deliver it much at much higher doses. It would be very different because we this drug potentially could be given just like chemotherapy, but you know through the vein. But then you would have to give a much lower dose, uh, and it would be likely to be less effective. Um, because of that. So what makes it special here is that because it's bound to the antibody uh, and it's released inside the cell itself, you can give a much more potent dose um, and, and from that standpoint. But the, but the half-life itself uh, should, uh, um, I actually don't know the exact answer to the half-life, but it, it should be pretty quick, but it really should be no circulating um, detectable drug. Yeah. Okay. I have a couple of things that are still a little confused about how Blenrep is affecting how can it affect other cells that don't express BCMA? So can you explain one more time um, how specifically BlenRep leads to keratopathy? Yeah, so, um, so the short answer is we don't know for sure, um, but having uh, other drug conjugates that use this particular toxin or chemotherapy called MMAF, uh, it appears to be a toxin-specific um, toxicity. And so uh, Blenrep is an antibody and it's bound to the toxin, right? So when the, when the antibody binds BCMA, that's its target, that's bound on the plasma cells themselves, it attacks, it uh, attaches to the BCMA. The plasma cell or the myeloma cell now internalizes the whole antibody drug conjugate or the whole complex gets internalized, kind of like a Trojan horse. So as it gets internalized, the antibody is cleaved away from the chemotherapy, the chemotherapy is released, and then the, the myeloma cell is killed. So the chemotherapy uh, then obviously has to, because once the cell lyses, the chemotherapy does get released some, of course, uh, and so it's the chemotherapy itself that likely is leading to the toxicity. Now, the interesting part is that you don't really see significant levels in the blood um, and so that's why we can't say for sure exactly mm -hmm. how chemotherapy is doing that, or perhaps the antibody uh, itself, um, perhaps maybe 
you know, if you have the antibody and you're doing ADCC and the antibody drug conjugate is not internalized, perhaps then the chemotherapy is being released outside of the of the of the actual plasma cell and leading to the toxicity. But the truth is, nobody really knows the exact mechanism of action. Interesting. Thank you. Um, so one patient is wondering if treatment with daratumumab has been successful, um, but then the efficacy of the daratumumab has kind of slowed down. Do you would you recommend an antibody drug conjugate as a next step? Yeah. So um, so that's a difficult question to answer. So just remember that we have a lot of myeloma therapies, right? And so a lot of the sort of the treatments and what is the best option for you depends on and how well they worked um, and, uh, and also how many you've had. So for example, Blenrip right now is only FDA approved after you, a patient has had four prior lines of therapy, um, which is actually pretty late in the game. So if you're on, on Darcelex, that's your second line or even in your front line, uh, and then you're starting to progress, Blenrip would actually not be an option for you uh, unless it's on a clinical trial looking at earlier uh, dosing, which is, here's where I get to plug clinical trials. And that's why they're so important. Not only do we get answers, not only do we then get to hopefully figure out the best way to use the drugs, but it also gives access to patients much earlier. Um, and so, for example, I have patients who, who had uh, a CAR T probably now six or seven years ago. Um, so it's just, just so you know, so and that via a clinical trial, of course. So, so again, I would encourage you that if, if you are progressing or if you're starting, if your doctor's looking at your next line of therapy, if a clinical trial is available to you to, to consider that. Um, and so again, that question would be, uh, it's difficult to answer specifically for the person that has to, uh, but definitely this would be an option for someone who is refractory or progressing after an anti-CD38 antibody as like DART select. Great, thank you. Um, after the four lines of prior therapy, is there a minimum percentage of myeloma cells required before starting Blenrip? Uh, so the short answer is no. Um, so as soon as your, uh, you and your doctor have determined that your myeloma is progressing, uh, then the, nothing, no, no particular uh, degree of disease is required to be treated as a standard of care. Now, a clinical trial is a little bit different. Uh, and so fortunately, clinical trials have to prove that their drug works, right? So we need to be able to measure your disease. And so usually that's done uh, by the M protein in your blood or uh, urine uh, that uh, determines whether you, what you consider measurable disease, uh, the free light chains. Uh, so anyway, so so yes, yeah, so if on, on a clinical trial, you would, you would need a certain amount of disease uh, that is measurable, but uh, as standard care, the answer is no. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Joseph's wondering, in the uh, spirit of clinical trials, there are many trials going on to, well, there are some trials going on to enhance the presence of BCMA. Is there, uh, what are your thoughts on these trials and is there any hope? Um, yeah, no, I think that's great. So um, actually it turns out that uh, BCMA can be downregulated after you start treating with BCMA, just and BCMA therapy, it's just like with any other target, right? The cell is very smart. It tries to kind of decrease so you can actually increase the expression of BCMA in myeloma cells uh, with uh, this thing called G GSI. Um, and, um, and that's being tested right now. Um, it's, uh, it's being looked at both with CAR-Ts uh, and with the bispecific antibodies, but also in, you know, I mentioned the uh, DREAM-5 study. Uh, that's one of the arms uh, of, uh, that is being looked at is actually using GSI to increase expression of BCMA and see if it actually uh, potentiates uh, the efficacy of something like Glenrip. So great question, more to come, stay tuned. <laughs> That's fascinating. Our patient educate, our patient population is so educated. I love their questions. It's amazing. I, I tell you, these questions are, are way more sophisticated than the ones I get at panels that like <laughs> or anything like that. So, okay. <laughs> That's great. That's awesome. Thank you for helping me prepare for those. For those yes, questions. exactly. <laughs> Um, another question that they have, and again, this is on par with how educated the patient population is, but let's talk about the efficacy of antibody drug conjugates versus bites and um, how, and, and if you could briefly explain bites for those in the um, audience who might not be familiar. And then um, the follow-up question is, how will, how soon will those be available commercially? Yeah, so it's an excellent question. So um, 
the the bytes or by specifics um, uh, are the are basically an antibody that has two targets. It's the easiest way to put it. So unlike the monoclonal antibody like Darcelex that just binds to CD38 um, and then waits for the immune system to come and uh, to, to, to see it bound and then and let's say waits for the T cell to come and see it bound and actually kill the myeloma cell. The biospecifics of the bites have two targets. One target is the myeloma cell and the other target is CD3, which is usually found on T cells. And so by binding the T cell, it activates the T cell. It basically um, activates the T cell. The T cell now turns around, sees the bound antibody, and it basically you're basically lassoing and forcing your T cells to go after the bound antibody on the myeloma cell. So we call those T cell redirecting therapies. There is no chemotherapy, nothing. It's purely an immune activating therapy. And actually, I will put the bispecifics and bites sort of at par with the CAR T cells, because we're doing the same thing with CAR T cells. But the difference here is that we're actually we're actually putting the antibody on the on the T cell itself, so the antibody now or the the CAR T now can identify uh, uh, myeloma cells even without an antibody. Uh, and so, but you're also redirecting those T cells to go fight myeloma. Uh, and so, those are the kind of responses we're seeing. So, um, I sort of separate them a little bit from the ADCs. I think the bispecific spikes and CAR Ts are giving us much higher response rates. Um, and are looking much more sort of powerful in that sense. Um, whereas the ADC is more like the, like Darcelex and other monoclonal antibodies with the added potential of having sort of this, this directed toxin. Um, and so, uh, so they're very different to compare. Uh, and just like the first question you asked me earlier about, you know, it's gonna be about patient selection and what makes sense. Now, the added benefit of the bispecifics uh, against the CAR-Ts is that uh, these will be off the shelf. Uh, and so they will be more available, uh, similar to the ADC, uh, for someone who needs treatment right away and can't wait for a CAR T to be manufactured. Having said that, the bispecifics also will have the potential toxicities that CAR we see with CAR Ts, which include the cytokine release syndrome and neurotoxicity. And so, someone, uh, a patient that's more frail, may not be able to withstand the intensity of that therapy and may still be preferable to go on the ADC. So. Um, Right now, there are no bispecifics that are approved, um, but the question is, when do I expect one? Actually, uh, most likely the first one we'll see approved uh, it will be teclistamam, uh, and that is a CD, um, or BCMA CD3 uh, bispecific, um, and that, that probably will be coming in about a year or less. Um, uh, actually, uh, talquetamab, talquetamab is not too far uh, uh, along, uh, away from that, uh, and maybe at another six months. Uh, to that one. Um, and that is actually a different target. That's not even BCMA, that's GPRC5D. So um, there's lots of excitement, lots of new things coming uh, your way, which again, all of these are available on clinical trials. <laughs> you don't have to wait for them to be FDA approved if you have access to clinical trials. That's exactly what I was going to say. Thank you for putting that plug in. Yeah. And, and so exciting. Um, you and I were talking about earlier before we even started the meeting, just what hope there is in the multitude of myeloma treatments that have been approved recently and are even being tested right now. I mean, you were saying even four years ago, you couldn't have, you, we weren't, um, you, we didn't have this uh, on the horizon. Yet. So it's very exciting. Um, Couple more questions and then we'll finish up here. Uh, there's a question about do ADCs lead to secondary cancers? Um, yeah, no, that's an excellent question. Uh, not that we're aware of, um, uh, uh, at least at this point. Um, now re realize that you know there's no sort of long-term data with these, uh, at least in myeloma. There are there is longer term data with other diseases like lymphomas uh, or uh, even Hodgkin's where they are used there. The problem is that it, it is always hard to know if somebody does develop a secondary malignancy, whether it's from that particular drug or something that was given prior. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing with CAR-T. So we know that some people are getting secondary malignancies after CAR-T, but the truth is most likely it is related to the prior you know, Revomit, the prior transplant chemotherapy that was given. And so you have this cumulative sort of continuous, um, I guess, uh, sort of kind of hits uh, that can increase your risk as you get sort of more relapsed refractory. So, but, but by itself, uh, uh, there's no 
there's no obvious, there is a potential for sure because it is a chemotherapy, but there's no obvious data to suggest that that's the case. Awesome, thank you. Uh, are there any age limitations? The stem cell transplant occasionally with varying doctors has an age limitation. Do you see age limitations? You mentioned frail patients, but is there any age limitations for ADCs, CAR T, or by specifics? Um, there is actually no particular age limitation. Um, uh, now, some studies do limit uh, age. Um, uh, most don't. Uh, it's really more about organ function and uh, performance status. And so, um, as long as you know you meet criteria for you know kidney function and heart function and all these different things, uh, the age by itself should should not be excluded. Uh, excluding, um, there actually we did. Um, um, we actually looked at the at the IDA cell, for example, which is a CAR T, uh, looking at those patients because there were patients enrolled up to seventy nine, but there was no cutoff. That was just the oldest patient. Um, looking at the patients who were seventy or older, and there's really no difference in the toxicity or efficacy of the drug in the older patients versus the younger patients. Uh, and so uh, again, uh, it's it's really going to be sort of you and your doctor uh, determining uh, whether you are strong enough for some of these therapies, uh, but not necessarily because of age. Awesome, thank you. And um, I don't know how to say this without, just if you don't feel comfortable with what your doctor has said, and you can also seek a second opinion. If you feel strong enough, if you feel healthy enough, if, you know, if it's relatively something that you are strongly passionate about and interested in, and you don't feel comfortable, always seek a second opinion, and then you know for sure whether or not um, that's true. <laughs> Um, no, I, I agree. I think it, it, that's always an important thing. No, no doctor should uh, be impossible uh, when you want to get a second opinion. Um, you know, there's some nuances. Uh, they may not be familiar with a particular therapy, and uh, and, and they actually don't know the answer. Um, and so it's it's not it's not it's not wrong to seek a second opinion um, at any point that you feel that you want to know more. Um, yeah. Awesome, thank you. One last question here. Um, what would you recommend? And this is more of a personally based question. So just if you could give a general answer to a personal question. <laughs> um, what would you recommend for someone who's 11 years out with extramedullary disease, has been through four different clinical trials, including um, I'll, SAR, SAR, and CellMod 480, which is failing after 10 months? Um, often, if I could just make a comment here, often um, patients feel um, like there's no other steps and it's a very anxious and um, undesirable feeling. Um, what, what feedback do you have for this specific patient? Well, I mean, I think, um, again, it's always hard to give specific um, advice, not knowing the entire clinical record and, and, and you actually don't want them to. You know, yeah, I, I don't have all of the facts in front of me, so so that's why it is important uh, to to, um, to to listen to your doctor, but then maybe get a second opinion to just make sure that everything coincides. And also, we all have different clinical trials, so just because there may be you're sort of exhausting your uh, options um, that are standard of care, uh, doesn't mean that there is not something that's being looked at that may be effective. Um, I was talking. Uh, earlier before we started, um, uh, that I have a patient that actually um, has gone through now four lines of therapy on different immunotherapies in the last five years. And at that time, we thought we had, he had exhausted all standard of care options. So, so again, just because something is not FDA approved or an option right now doesn't mean that there's not something that's looking fairly active that is in clinical trials. So that's what for, for, for this particular person that sounds like they've gone through several clinical trials already or exhausted, and you may have exhausted clinical trials at your site. Remember, we all have different trials. Uh, we can't all have the same trials because then we wouldn't be able to sort of kind of uh, really push everything forward as much as we can because, you know, not every patient will go to one site. So <laughs> you to actually, you know, make sure you, you know, with the help of Mama Crowd um, to uh, to find if there's, you know, based on, on your prior therapies, whether you would be eligible for some other clinical trials, because um, there are trials looking at even patients who failed some of these, you know, things we're talking about, um, looking at, you know, mechanisms of resistance and why are they failing um, and allowing patients who've had prior therapies. So for example, there's 
there's a trial right now ongoing that for patients who have failed prior BCMA therapies, even failed prior um, GPRC5D therapies, looking at combinations to try and overcome the immune resistance to that and see if you can gain um, a function. So uh, again, and then there's new targets uh, uh, all the time, of course, as well. So, so I would encourage you to seek out some of those therapies if you're still uh, feel that more therapy is, is, uh, is needed. Awesome. Thank you. And thank you for the plug I was going to mention as well. Um, the Myeloma Crowd by Health Tree has personalized clinical trial options for you through Health Tree Care Hub, which is something that I will be including more information about in our follow up email that we'll send. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Bredeja, for your time, for your presentation, for your question, I mean, answers to the questions. I truly appreciate you and um, thank you so much for being here today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we'll close with just a couple of outro announcements and then we'll finish. You can join us next month. We're going to be continuing discussion on bispecific antibodies. What role do they play in myeloma? How soon can we expect them to be FDA approved? We talked about that a little today, but we'll just, as I said, continue deep in the discussion next month. We're still working on a potential speaker to find a date and time with them, but we will add more details about this event and let you know via email when it's ready to register for. You may be interested in other Myeloma Crowd community events we have upcoming tomorrow at 1 p.m. Actually, that has been changed. It's going to be at 12 p.m. That was just recently changed, so that's why it's not reflected here in the slides. It's going to be one hour earlier at 12 p.m. Eastern. That's going to be our relapse refractory myeloma treatment chapter, and Dr. Benjamin Derman is going to be sharing about infection infection prevention for multiple myeloma patients, because as we know, we're working so hard to fight against myeloma. We don't want to die from anything else um, or get sick due to anything else. Um, that's the reality of it. On Thursday, May 26th, the African-American Myeloma Community Chapter is meeting to talk about changing your diet while keeping your culture. My um, MGUS patient, Will Wright, is going to talk about a clinical trial that he took part in um, that completely changed his life reduced his comorbidities, and has potentially slowed down the progression of his um, MGUS to smoldering myeloma, which is extremely exciting. And then on the 26th at 2 p.m. Eastern is our newly diagnosed myeloma patients chapter. We're going to be talking about clinical trials for newly diagnosed patients with John Rosengard. He's going to be sharing as a newly diagnosed patient, the Griffin trial that he participated in, what that looks like, how many years that lasted, and how he's doing now. Um, often we think of clinical trials for something in the relapsed refractory setting, but it can even be for newly diagnosed patients. And as Dr. Bredeja was saying, it's such an excellent way to further myeloma research. Um, a special thank you to our sponsors, Bristol Mary Squibb, GSK, Genentech, Janssen Oncology, and Abby. And thank you to each of you for taking time out of your day to be with us and to learn together. Hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>